Anyway, comments, um, comments, uh, questions, whatever you you feel like. It's an open open forum here. This is uh, you need to do more in English. I'm excited about your message. I think that the English speaking world is missing out on a lot of your uh, teaching. It's excellent. Also, I had a question about Isaiah chapter 66. You know, verse 23, 24, it says, All flesh will come to worship before me, says the Lord. And of course, all means all. Then yeah. it turns around and says that you're going to go forth and look upon the carcasses or yes. the dead bodies of those who have uh, transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring or a hatred unto all flesh. And I'd like your comment on that verse. I know Jesus quoted it in Mark 9 about uh, the fire, the worm that will not die and the fire that will be not be quenched. Yes. Okay. So, very good question. Very good question. So, if we go there to Isaiah 66, okay, um, I'm going to answer answer you utilizing the illustration that uh, we used through the presentation with the lake of fire. Okay. So, um, when you have the lake of fire, you put you put a metal and in that metal there's gold but in that metal there's nickel there's this this copper there's everything else right you throw that there fire and brimstone you know sp uh, you, sp everything comes up and it's put on the side outside of that bucket the which is the lake of fire this the the limme uh, so outside of that that bucket is placed there what is placed outside of that jacket is all the rubbish, all the impurities, okay? All the leftovers, all the mortality of human, all the all the perishing men, if you will. Because when you study study Paul, you realize that Paul is always talking about the the true men in within, the perishing mortal man that is perishing. That, that this tabernacle that is perishing and we're looking forward to put on immortality. The, the uh, you know, uh, even when we're looking at, um, even when we're looking at the, the, the weeds and the tears, the weeds and the tears, you know, there's people that say to me, well, but if it's very clear, you got the tears, I've got to the fire, mate. And you got the weed that goes into the granary. Straightforward, isn't it? And I said, okay, are you a weed or a tear? And they go, but the, but the grace of God, this is the typical answer, but the grace of God, I ho I'm hoping that, you know, he will make me a, uh, a weed. And I said, okay, if I asked your wife, if I asked your wife, would your wife say that you have a little bit of uh, some tears on you? And he goes, oh, well, yes, but everybody does. Said, you see? The weeds and the tears are not two different people separately to each other. It's two people living under the same roof, meaning this, <coughs> meaning our, ourselves. So, because if you look at the, the weeds and the tears, at what point the weed be can become a tear, and at what point the tear can become a weed? Never. There's no conversion. Then obviously we're not Calvinist, in which you know if you are born a tear, tough luck, or if you're born a wheat, no matter what you do, you will be safe. And it's you know we're not Calvinists in that sense. So then, what on earth is happening here? If if you tear, the story never tells you, I was a tear and now I am a wheat. No, or oh, that person used to come to our church. He was one of us. He was he was heading into the granary. He was a weed. But now look at him. You know, now he's eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. He's a tear now. That is not what the parable is talking about. There's not there's no conversion from tears to weed. That doesn't exist. We're missing the whole point of the parable. The thing is, in the same field, in the same heart of man. In the same heart of men, you have the heart, pure heart that God plays on a baby, because there's not a baby that is a racist. But that same baby that was born not a racist becomes a Nazi racist when he is 20. 
So the tares are now growing in the same field where the good seed was planted. And God has planted uh, eternity in the heart of every man. Now, the same way that you'll have the gold extracted and on, on outside is all the leftover. The same way that this mortal has to be put on immortality. When we, the redeemed, walk out of that city, because oh, bear in mind that it's a word picture also. We can only speak of, of uh, eternal things with human language. Okay? So as used in human language, as we leave the city to see the carcasses of those lost, this is what's going to happen to you. I've got your name here as Del. Is, is that is that your name, Del? I got it. In... Yes, Del. That's Del, short okay. for Del. Thank so you. So this is what's going to happen to you, Del. You're going you're going to go through a human museum, a human exhibit museum, and you're going to go out with your wife and with your children to the human exhibit museum, and you're going to go and say, "Look at this. This is Hitler," and it has you know this is Hitler, you know, and it has the name of the exhibit. And then you keep on walking. Look at this. You know, this is the man that killed Martin Luther King. And then, oh, it's amazing. And then you will go into different rooms type of thing. And using word pictures here, you enter into a room. It will be a dark room. And the light is, is, is dimmed down. And say, oh, I wonder what exhibit they got here. And then you sort of, you're trying to find for the switch. And you you turn the light. And, and, the, and you sort of, you know getting a little brighter and you come closer and you come closer and come closer and you see the distorted features of a man that had fears, that had insecurities, that had many, many lack of faith, that he believed that he was not a good father, not a good husband, he was not good enough for, for his job, that, that he had uh, the imposter syndrome in many uh, accomplishments in his life, that he had uh, low self-esteem, that, you know, that, that he did this and he did that and he and he used some white lie here and this, that and the other and whatever, whatever. And as you come close and you come close and you come close and you see the name. And you know what he says, Del? is you. It's the impurities that have been left out because the, the coward impurities that not enter in. The, the fornicators do not enter in. You know, every, you know the the fearful does not the coward, the fearful, the, the, the all the the coward Oscar does not enter in. The fearful Oscar does not enter in. The insecurity Oscar does not enter in. The mortal does not enter in. So we will see the caskets of those. But lo listen to this, verse twenty four, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpse. Of the man who had transgressed against me. Now, Dell, how many men have transgressed against him? Oh. Every oh. human being. Every human being is a human museum exhibit. And ultimately, when we will not spend the time on looking at the figure of Hitler, we will look at all the fears that all the restraints of fear that we, we we've been living with all this time. We become we we become our own our own self-proclaimed prophets. I can't do that. I'm a bad father. I'm a bad husband. I'm a you know. I do. We become our worst prophets and self-fulfilled too based on our insecurities and low self-esteem and, and self-imposed restrictions, uh, etc., that limits the possibility to actually live a little bit of the heavenly kingdom in our reality here. So that's actually how it is, because you can't... So all flesh shall come and worship before me. All is all. And then you go, but yeah, but... but 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 then they go and see the corpse of the man who transgressed. Who, how many transgressed? All have fall short, fallen short. But by one man, all sin, all transgressed. 
But those, you know, that's why I'm saying the wheat goes in, the tears stay out. But these are not two types of people. These are two people living in the reality that we live in here. The things that I want to do, I end up not doing. I wish I could do this. I wish I could be more courageous to do that or the other. And the things that I, I know I should not do, get frustrated with these, and then I end up doing. If if I leave the house today and I've got a flat tire, I will get frustrated again. You know how many flat tires I had in my lifetime? Lots. And I still get frustrated. The things that I know I shouldn't be doing, I end up still doing. It's the battle of the man's plural, inside, the heavenly man or the spiritual man that it grows with Christ every day and the one that is perishing as they, uh, is perishing and eventually will be left behind. That's what we'll be looking at, the corpse of the man that sinned against God, not of the, of the pure heart baby-like human that can sit with a Jew, can sit with a black person, can sit with a European or a Chinese and play together without seeing color or religion or nationality. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, it does say that all flesh will worship me, but then it all says that the worm shall not die. And so even though the worm is uh, suffering terribly through the fire, it doesn't die. So that gives hope. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes. Any comments? Yeah, I always, I, I always see the, the tears, I guess, as um, being lies, you know, especially lies about ourselves, um, you know, and the, the worthlessness that you described. I think to me, worthlessness is at the core of what sin is. And I think... Um, Pride is just a covering of that worthlessness. So the the lie is that we're we are not uh, God's beloved children. That we're not valuable. We need to perform and prove our worth. You know, and um, it's this worthlessness that leads to destructive living. Uh, you know, treating others as worthless because we project that worthlessness out in a destructive behavior. Mm. And um, yeah, so I, I really think the cure for it is the truth about who we truly really are. And, and then once our identity changes, that's when our behavior changes. So I guess the church, you know, I kind of say we're putting the, the cart, you know, in front of the horse. You know, we're trying to get people's behavior right while they're still believing they're worthless, wretched sinners. And, um, yeah, so it just leaves people in a more of a hopeless state than when they started, you know, and uh, confirms those lies that they've been taught. Um, whereas I think when we're taught the unconditional love of God, it, it, it brings healing and it allows us to, to actually claim, reclaim our identity as sons and daughters of God. And, um, and yeah, we're, we're delivered from all of, you know, a lot of the destructive uh, thinking and destructive lies that, you know, the tears are burnt up in the love of God. You know, ultimately the lies um, are burnt up. You know, I guess God says he came to destroy the works of the devil. And the works of the devil, he's the father of lies, you know. And, um, yeah, so I think the fire of God's love is also truth and it destroys the lies and the tears you know, in that fire of, of truth and love. But um, I guess, um, yeah, there's one other thing, but that's that's basically, yeah, what I was thinking. Um, yeah, anyway, mm -hmm. I love the presentation. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, th thanks, Chris, for your comment too. Uh, I, I I agree with you 100% uh, on, on that. This, uh, this a, a lot of things. Let, let me just mention something before before uh, some, someone else's uh, comment. Um there's a story. It's, it's in it's in German. I'll probably have to find it. Uh, this is so. This this woman. This woman has a near death experience in the in, in Austria. She's skiing with her husband, and an avalanche avalanche comes uh, down the hill and covers her, and she feels this pressure. Everything goes dark, and she feels this pressure over her chest. You know, she can't breathe, she can't breathe, she feels this pressure. Uh, she's covered by snow. Uh, and poof, all of a sudden, she sees herself um, above the snow. And she sees the husband trying to search for her like crazy. You know, trying to search for her like crazy. And very, very soon, these rescue teams are coming. 
uh, at the, from the ski resort and they're digging, digging, digging. And, and she sees these metal detectors, you know, trying to sort of dig her out. And and she doesn't realize, oh, they're trying to dig me out. Hopefully they, they'll find me, they'll find me. And then she realized, hold on a second. <laughs> if I am down there, how am I able to see it, right? So that was, that was a bit weird. And when she realized, hold on a second, what on earth am I, I am here? I'm, I'm looking for an above, you know? And all of a sudden, boof, sort of the image goes and she feels as if she has arrived to a place called home. She has no pain whatsoever, but call home in which, you know, like, you know, when you enter into the house and uh, I mean, I went to, in August, I went to back to Spain to sit, to visit my mom and, and you enter through the house and, and there's a smell of Spanish omelette that she has ready for you. And it's like, boom, it takes you back to your childhood. You know, like, I'm home. Well, she was like home, but at the same time, she, she was at home, though she'd never been there, but she was at home, kind of thing. And you know how they say, you know, that when you are about to die, you see all your life rushing through, you know, in 30 seconds in front of your eyes. Well, she had all her life going through in front of her, every single person that she encountered. But everything was simultaneously appearing and not just the lives that they, that she saw and she encountered over her life, but together with the, the, the story behind those li lives, okay? All that simultaneously, as if you have all your computer screens open and you're watching simultaneously all the the uh, movie platforms, you know, Netflix and Amazon and whatever, all of them with all the providing movies or with all the screens, all at the same time, running at the same time. So every single person that she encountered. And um, the thing is that, you know, from school friends to people that that she lost contact with, whatever. And this is a woman that was just over 50 and she was raped when she was a child, but one, one ankle of hers. Bear in mind that all her life she's been in and out of uh, psycho uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, in and out of depression, in and out of medication, trouble with intimacy with her, has with her husband, um, influenced the way she educated the children, you know, if they want, the children wanted to do on a sleepover, she would just go all, no, 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 you know, you can't go, and she would get very upset, so the children never went for a sleepover, uh, because, you know, because that influenced what had happened to her, influenced her way of educating the children, intimacy with the husband, etc., etc., etc. So, together with everything else, also, there was that screen with the life and event of what happened to her because of their uncle. And at the same time, at the same time, the life of the uncle. So not just how those people influenced your life, but also how their lives were, were influenced in and of themselves. So imagine that kind of overload of information all at once. And she saw their uncle's father abusing him and... She saw a lot of things in that in that scenario. This is a secular lady from European background, Austria, professional, so on. So all of a sudden, boom, she feels a lot of pressure on her chest and she starts hearing, she's here, she's here, she's here. They take her out, they take her to the hospital and the doctor goes and said, you've been under the snow 15 minutes. And she goes, that can't be possible. And the doctor said, yeah, we know, 15 minutes. And, you know, and, and, and you're, you're alive. It's a miracle. And she goes, no, no, that can't be possible. Cannot be 15 minutes. I thought I was there for days and days and days. If I just pick one of the stories, one of the stories with all the details that, that I understood from those stories and start just telling you about it, I will need days just for one of the stories. And it had she had thousands of stories. You know what she did when she left the hospital? She went to a particular city in Austria, knocked at a door, and an old man opened the door. That old man was her uncle, already in, in, in his 80s. She looked at him. He looked at her. She walked in, no words spoken. 
She just nodded, tears in her eyes, gave him a hug, and said, I love you, and God loves you. He broke in tears, he broke in tears, and broke in tears. And then, you know, they, they have a kappa, and then, then she left. And she says in this interview, for 50 odd years, this has conditioned all my life. 15 minutes under this, in the, in the snow, and has healed me. 15 minutes under the snow. So, why am I telling you this story? God doesn't need a thousand years in a lake of fire or a thousand years for us to think about it. You just need to put us 15 minutes under the snow and it will heal hu humanity's problems. Okay? We just need to make sure that, you know, one of the things that, that she described was the fact that when we hear, we don't realize, but there is a weight. It's, it's like, it's not just the weight of gravity. It's just the weight, the weight of expectation, the weight of, you know, the, the, the society. There's a weight here. There's a weight here. When, I, when I'm working uh, in anesthetics, when I'm working in anesthetics, you know, we give a a drug to 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 patients you know getting them ready for for an operation you know and and they go oh i like that what was the name was the name of this drug and i said the name of this drug is i don't care anymore drug is the i don't care anymore drug because at that point you can do a catheter on that person you know it doesn't matter you know sorry we're just going to do a catheter on you you know is that all right we need to uncover you that's all right. That's all right. They don't care. They don't care any. And I said, how is your knee? My knee. My knee is good. Oh, they go, oh, it doesn't hurt. Oh, my, it doesn't hurt. And we had people with the spinal anesthetics start crying. You know, oh, my hip doesn't, doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. They, they, so what I'm saying is that we are living under certain things in this dimension that, that as in a word picture, biblical language picture, human biblical language picture, as the sky rolls away, certain things will be lifted up. Certain things, certain perceptions will be changed. Uh, I hope somebody asked me about um, uh, Philippians two, but if but I'll let I'll let um, I'll let someone else make a comment or a question. Yeah, it's really it's really uh, this whole your whole talk actually has inspired so many new thoughts. I really appreciate it. Your understanding, the way you've explained it, I haven't heard it this way before, so it's been powerful for me. Just thought I'd make a comment. Uh, yeah, me too. I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, thank you. And I, I work with um, children who have trauma. So it just brings a tear to your eye every day. And I, I had this you are message for a few years and just know that, I don't know, maybe God's put me there to just show me that he's going to look after them. And, and uh, it's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Exactly. Thank, thanks for that. Thank and you. those children with trauma, if they don't dry because of the trauma, they become adults in jail. Yeah, that's it. That's how it works, isn't it? Yeah. The so jail think... is not full of, of people, of children that came from a loving house and caring house, and they didn't have any sudden deaths or sudden illnesses and things like that. It comes from broken people. But if we are so short-sighted that we look at uh, action, and we judge them by that action and not by the complete package. Uh, we we saw selfish and narrow minded uh, in the, in that sense. Yeah. Mm. Let, let, let me let me share with you Philippians two because I want to make sure. Look, by the way, I I've got all the verses that the uh, restoration of humanity can find in the scriptures. I've got them all. I know them all, and I can argue them all, but. I don't do so. I don't argue. I don't believe in apologetics. I don't believe in debate. The word debate comes from the Greek and it actually means war to war. So if a person is, um, you know, 
in fact, there has been a number of Spanish channels that have contacted me to do a debate and I said, no, no. Like, if you want to do a podcast and we have a chat like this, fine, no worries. But if you want to go for a debate and you're going to go with your hermeneutics and trying to convince me with your hermeneutics and it's going to be a head-on collision on hermeneutics and things like that, uh, I'm not I'm not interested. The reason why I'm not interested is because my God is a God of peace and I have to take that very seriously to the ultimate consequences. So um, I'm, I don't get into arguments uh, or anything or anything like that. But it's also good for us to to see certain things. How how many of you have have ever come across an interpretation of this verse of these verses that is that is I would say very much taken out of context. It says this in uh, Philippians chapter two. Um, he says that um, in verse nine, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, uh, should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You go, okay, well, there you go. Clear as, as anything. You know how they can they, they can twist that? They say this, and see how many of you have heard this argumentation. But at that point, it will be too late. The, 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 the door of grace has, would have been already closed. It will be too late. And at that point, God will take them and will throw them into the lake of fire and be destroyed forever. Have you, have you heard that, that comment on that? Well, yeah. There is a there is a commentary in a well known yes by, a, by an organisation. Yep, correct. Um, that they use that verse and it says "force from unwilling lips." Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, can you lie to God and God doesn't know that you're lying? He knows all things. He knows all things. So why would they say confess first of all? If they're not confessing. Well, I think the bigger point is how can it be to the glory of God the Father? Um, exactly. Well, yeah. the thing the thing is, as you know, the Bible, the Bible does have and the, the Bible writers do do find echoes. They do find echoes, you know, because it's like echoes in the Bible are biblical ways of 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 uh, footnoting references, you know how we, if we write a paper today and we we quote in a book or whatever, we we put a footnote, and that's how we link our paper, our uh, scientific paper or medical paper or whatever. We 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 kind of we we group ourselves with a bigger bigger picture, you know, and that's why we quote all the published papers and things like that. We we use footnotes and and bibliography and things like that. Well, the way in which it was actually done in biblical times, not just with the Bible, but even in, in, in Greek literature and so on, is by having echoes of other, other books. And so authors in, in the books of the Bible, they, they provide echoes. And the, those echoes are ways of, of the footnoting. The ancient footnoting will be echoes. That's why you see references that you, you have a verse that is mentioned here, 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 in different books. Those are those echoes. And that's just to provide yourself with that kind of um, part of the bigger picture type of thing. So if you go to Zephaniah, Zephaniah 10, 62, that's when Philippians 2 is, the, is echoing. Philippians 2 comes from Zephaniah. So if you go to Zephaniah um, chapter 3, you'll, you'll see it in a minute. That's the echo. That's where the, verse, the verses are coming, uh, are coming from. Um, let me just see. So, Zephaniah Sifan is one of those books that um that you need to <laughs> many pages to find it. There you go, Zephaniah chapter three. And if you go and go and say, let's say chapter six. No, sorry, but, uh, uh, verse six. Zephaniah three, verse six. And we're going to read further, further there. Okay. I have cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I have made their streets desolate. We, 
uh, with none passing by. Their cities are destroyed. There's no one, no inhabitants. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction now, right? So that our dwelling will not be cut off despite everything for which I punish her. But they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise for plunder. So wait until the day I'm coming with plunder, right? It's going to come with plunder with fire. Look, look at this. My determination is to gather the nations to my, uh, sorry, um, the, the plunder, where did I? Verse 7, sorry, uh, verse 7. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so that our dwelling will not be cut off despite everything for which I punish her. Sorry, verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fear, anger, all the earth shall be devoured. Then that's one word that is used with the fire, right? All the earth will be devoured by the fire with the fire of my jealousy. So there you go. There's your fire, right? Okay, notice verse 9. For then, and if you have different versions, you'll say, and after that, after the fire, not before the fire, after the fire, for then, or after then, or then, I will restore to the peoples a pure Tongue. It says language. The word is tongue. A pure tongue. That they all might call on the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. If you go to the version, it says, and serve him with free will. So the language or the tongue is pure when they all my call on the name of the Lord. The language or the tongue is pure, it's not deceitful, it's pure. And the service, the service is not forceful, is um, of one accord, but as I said, you got different versions, and in a number of translations will say of free will or willingly. That's the echo of Philippians 2. They will call on the name of the Lord and they will confess with their tongues. But it's not, uh, not and then, then it's not the fire. The fire came before. But as I said, I'm not talking about a literal here. We're talking about a refining of our, getting rid of our fears, getting rid of our misconceptions and, and things like that. Okay. <laughs> So and and like this, as I said, I know all the verses pro and I know all their arguments against. It's, it's it, and it's just a war of hermeneutics. Ultimately, if uh, in fact I finished now a series uh, trial uh, a three three part series uh, talking about uh, quantum mechanics and how quantum mechanic mechanics proves um, the restoration of all all. Um, all humanity uh, and I, I, we just did it using a different language rather than using a biblical language we use a quantum mechanic language which is a, still a human language but sort of you know just to present the same thing there was there's also um i wonder uh the other one you probably uh the other one that it references is i think isaiah 45 23 and it says i've sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth it will um, in righteousness and shall not return unto me um, void, I guess, um, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. And I guess the word allegiance is, um, it's like, um, it's not just that they're bearing, that they're bowing in, you know, um, submission, you know, under duress, but they're actually declaring their own fidelity and allegiance to, to God as um as their leader you know it's i think it's like a military term that's kind of like you know um they're swearing their 
an oath essentially to to bear allegiance and and to fight for God basically to fight with God and not against Him. Yeah, correct, correct. And and look, when we're talking about free will, um, I I personally and I studied this this topic as I said for um more than a decade now. Um, I don't believe that we do have a free will here as Christ, uh, some 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 denominations interpret it. And the reason for it is the uh, the fact that like if you give an up, you know, because they, they they normally say, oh God, God cannot cannot force them to worship. You want to they're not going to be forced to be safe if they don't want to be safe. Um so if you give an up if you get a if you give a if you offer a horse a rotten pear in one hand and a rotten apple in another hand. So the rotten pear being religion and the rotten apple being atheism, for instance, just to just to sort of put a, a, a cat in the middle. It might choose one or the other. It might choose one or the other. A religious person will call that free will. So rotten pear in one side will be religion. Rotten pear on the other side will be uh, atheism. And a religious person will say, okay, he has chosen religion out of its free will. Or if he has uh, uh, chosen um, the rotten uh, apple, which is atheism, out of his uh, out of the horse free, free will. I said, no, he's chosen either one of them out of hunger. Not out of will, out of hunger. Because I'm going to tell you one thing. If you give a third option and it's a fantastic, fresh looking apple, I, I had horses. I had a horse. I'm going to tell you that horse is going to look at you, it's going to put the tongue out, it's going to say, and it's going to go to the good apple. So this world is offering as a free will. Um, as a free will um, doctrine kind of thing, rotten apple or rotten pear. And some people think that um, they choose atheism, for instance, and a religious person will say, well, that person doesn't want to be safe. That person, God cannot, cannot uh, force them to be safe. What the religious person is saying is, well, God cannot force them to eat my rotten apple religion. So they're choosing their rotten pear atheism. And what I'm saying is, hold on a second, when we see face to face, when he is lifted up and a true pure apple is shown to all humanity, all humanity says, ah, hold on a second, is that what you meant? Ah, if, if if that's what you meant, I'm not a stupid. Because otherwise, you know, then you're not lost because of rebellion. You're lost for stupidity. And then we are saved by IQ. Do you know what I mean? So when he is lifted up in the hearts of every single human being, he will draw how many? All to himself. And that's one of the questions that I always ask. So when is that all to draw to himself? When is that going to happen? And they, they choke on that. They they don't like the all. They don't like the, the all that Paul uses, you know, as one man all sin, so as for one man all will be made whole. They don't like that whole. They, that, that, that all. They don't like it. They they choke. They start saying, yeah, but but it's but all that the belief, of course. Of course, it doesn't say, but it's of course all that belief because they, they don't like it. They don't follow the, the 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 trend on the on the verses, and they they struggle with that. And is as I said, is the syndrome of the older brother. Is the syndrome of the older brother. They their happiness is for their beliefs and their denomination beliefs or their theological beliefs to be the correct ones that they will grant them entry into the heavenly kingdom but that will not be enough the others had to be wrong and the others had to be left outside otherwise my happiness will not be full 
that is a very, very sickening syndrome. It's worse than cancer. And God, the good thing is that God will have to heal that one too. He will heal that one too. The, yeah, the it's a lot of a lot of the horses have been force fed uh, rotten apples from childhood, so exactly. you know, they didn't get choice in that, and and vice versa with the rotten pears, you know. So, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> and also, I was going to say, um, you're talking about near death experiences. I've I've looked at a lot of those too, and it's just fascinating, you know, and opens mm. the mind up to you know God's God can work in ways that we can't fathom. You know, He can do whatever He wants with whoever He wants, and you know, it's completely out of our control. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Mm. The, the 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 beautiful thing, you know, you know, I had a I had a gentleman that, uh, well, many, but uh, just the one that comes to mind. They said, "I I have seen a family that have been listening to your videos, and by their fruits you shall know them, and the fruits are now becoming evident." I said, "Oh, okay. Well, what do you mean?" I said, "Yeah, well, you, that family used to come to our church very faithfully. They started listening to your videos. Stop coming to to our church." Okay, by the fruit, and he kept on quoting, by the fruits they shall know you, they shall know them, you know. Stop coming to our church. See, by their fruits. Then they started, um, uh, uh, they started eating chicken. And he kept on quoting, by their fruits they shall know them, you know. <laughs> and then last day, I saw them coming out of uh, coming. Uh, I saw them, the entire family, the entire family coming out of the movie theaters. By the fruits, they shall know them. And I said, "Hold on a second. Did they kill anybody? Said, no. <laughs> Is she cheating on him? No, but I said, hold on a second. Like if you're going to invent your own things, yeah, then everybody's going to be guilty of something, you know. But since when eating a chicken breast?" Is by their fruit they shall know them. That, I mean, that's how ridiculous this is. You know what I mean? I had, as, 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 as I said many times to people that money doesn't change people. Money, money exposes people. So money exposes people. It doesn't change people. An arrogant man that is poor might look humble. Do you give him money? If he's arrogant, he was arrogant before. He was just sort of shabbed down. But he was arrogant before. The same way when a person is under the law and lives under the law and doesn't cheat on, on his wife because he's going to lose heaven. If he all of a sudden becomes convinced that God is going to save him anyway and cheats on his wife, it's not the doctrine of now believing that he's going to be saved anyhow that made him cheat on his wife. He was a wife cheater before when he was a legalist and an elder of his church. It's just that he was so legalist that his law wouldn't allow him for fear of the consequences. So then he thought, he, was a, he portrayed himself in a lie in his life and to others. At least in this scenario, we know that the impurities of the lake of fire are coming to the surface so for this man we now finally we see what he was before we couldn't see see that he was a cheetah because he was wearing his his tie and he was preaching from the pulpit now we can see he's a cheetah but it but what we see is what we what he was that has nothing to do with the fact that he's going to be restored because <laughs> how will you cheat on your wife if you believe in a god that that has as a base, not as a pillar, as a base, love your neighbor as yourself. How would someone that really believes that as the core base of his theology, or his or her theology, cheat on his wife or, you know, or kill somebody or steal or whatever? They wouldn't. And I'm specifically using the word base, not pillars, because every religion has pillars that they base themselves on. And I believe that Jesus didn't come to 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 point to place us on pillars of beliefs of fundamental beliefs. I think he came to set us at the base, at ground level. Ground level, on the base, on the rock, not on pillars, because you know what? All those pillars, you know, 
when you cut them down, you actually, the fall is just unbelievable. Okay. I, I, I fell down in 2010 and perhaps some of you fell down uh, before or after 2010. But m myself and my family, late 2009 uh, 2000, and beginning of 2010, I had a tremendous, tremendous fall. You know, why? Because my pillars, you know, like, praise God, you know, all the pillars were broken down. Now I'm on the base. I can't fall any further down. I'm at the base and the base is love is at the center of God's universe is the most powerful thing is the most powerful court you know um I wanna if there's no more comments I will I'll, I'll leave just um uh, now but uh, uh there is a testimony of uh, the the journey of faith of my family and it's in English uh you can see it in a if you type my name, Oscar Sander in YouTube, and you put, um, um, what is it? With with God in the fire, with with God in the fire, um, is the first one. With God in the fire, is the testimony of my wife. My wife died of cancer in September twenty six, two thousand and eighteen. It's the love of my life. I'm still married to her. Um, yeah, and because since. Death sets us apart until death sets us apart is something that it was it was introduced in religious weddings and the intention of God is for us to live forever. Uh, so I'll see my best friend uh, soon enough when time comes. I'm, I'm, I'm here at the moment getting up every morning for my children. My youngest is 20 um, and they need me. Uh, my oldest is married. Uh, my middle one and my youngest, they are both in a relationship, but they're still young. They need me. I'm here for them. In due time, I'll see my wife again. And she died of cancer, uh, and we, we had 23 years of marriage. And Jeffrey, Jeffrey, that is present, was present here, uh, knew my wife, uh, and she, and he knows the relationship that we had um, together. It was and uh, nice. and people will come. 2018, they will come to our house, and they they will always say to us, you know from different religious um, denominations, mainly from the religion denomination that we be belong, that used to belong to. And they'll say, they'll say to us, oh, we, 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 love, oh, we love your faith. You have such a faith. It's the faith, but it's faith with joy. Like you're dying, but you have faith with joy and we will share with them. And they left. Um, the only thing that, that saddened my wife was this. You know, honey, they want our faith and they want our joy, but they don't want our God. They want our faith. They want our joy. But all these religious people, they don't want our God. A God that will restore all. And a God that has love and restoration. Because when you have that love and ret restoration, death is not a fearful thing anymore. You know, saying goodbye to your husband is not is, doesn't have the same level of fear. Knowing that you're going to see him again, knowing that I'm going to see her again, you know, and that was the only thing that will sadden her, you know, because they will come and they will praise us for our joy and our faith in the time of struggle. I'll, and she said, they want our joy, they want our faith, but they don't want the God that gives us this joy. And he's the God that saves humanity. And he's on the name, Savior of the world. Is on the name. How can Christianity miss it? There were seven universe, seven theological theological centers in the first three centuries uh, after uh, after after Paul uh, and the apostles died. There were five theological centers. Out of those five theological centers, four of them believed in the restoration of all humanity using, using the Pauline letters, okay? In theology, we study the salvation of humanity by the Pauline letters. Is there four out of five theological centers of early Christianity believe in the restoration of all humanity? The fifth one didn't. It was Rome. Rome crossed Alessandria, 
Paul uh, closed ben the Benthamine Benth Benth thing. Clo Rome closed the other four. I'm not in the minority thinking this. I've got good companions thinking this. Not just Jesus and Paul, but early apostles, the, the, the New Testament, and the first century Christians believe this. Four out of the five theological centers of early Christianity believe in this. Abraham Lincoln believed in this. So, like, and there's many, many others. I just say Abraham Lincoln because it's a, it's a good, it's a good guy. And when I'm talking to um, American fundamentalist, I just throw Abraham Abraham Lincoln uh, there. So, well, look, if I'm going to burn in in hell, you know, it'll be very interesting because Abraham Lincoln will be there. You know, Hitler might be there, but Abraham Lincoln too. You know, so this and uh, and they, they they get surprised, and then they go onto the internet and they they realize yes. Abraham Lincoln believed in the restoration of all humanity. And he will not argue with anybody. He will just quote uh, Romans 6 to everyone. You know, they'll start arguing all, you know, he was he was living in a very heavily religious environment, you know, with many denominations and very, you know. Uh, and Abraham Lincoln will not argue with anyone. He will just quote Romans and will say, by one man, all sin. By one man, all women whole. Full. End of story. No more arguments. And he will walk out, out of the room. So, great companionship, you know, with Abraham Lincoln. Anyway, uh, any final comments or Sarah, you want to you wanna, um, close up here? Or comment or whatever? And we'll uh, let you go. You certainly made some thought-provoking comments, Oscar, and they really speak to my heart. I, I, I miss half of that. I don't know if it was your connection. Oh. Can, you can, you, can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying that you certainly made some thought-provoking comments. Oh, okay. By art. <laughs> All right. Well, th this is just a, sum a, a little little summary. Uh, what, I, what I'd really love, love um, and my wife love together is just once you realise that the person next to you is also worthy of salvation, it changes the way you treat people. It just changes the way you treat people. The way there's so many sect sectarian religious thinking today is because of that uh, exclusive grouping that, that, that is created. Um, um, you know, the... So it just changes the way you treat people. It changes the way you treat um, people that, that think differently than you. You respect them more. You listen because you don't need to convince them of anything. So you listen. You learn from them. It's just it makes you a better person. So if if it is by the fruits you shall know them, please don't check if I'm eating eating chicken or if I'm watching a, a series in Netflix. You know, by the fruit they shall know them. You know, just see how that person, you know, um, treats all the people. Yeah, you, you know? start viewing people in a hospital setting and you start seeing humanity is broken. We're all sick. You know, we all need healing. We all need Dr. Jesus to come and help us. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yesterday, I, we, were, we were very busy in the hospital um, and I... Walk into, we're just having a, a peppermint tea, and this anesthetist comes. And I've been following on on her, checking on her because um, the mother had had a um, hip replacement, and now the um, uh, and the father is just worried. So the father is like eighty nine, and the mother is like eighty five. Now the father is worried. What happens if if I die? Who is going to look after her? What happens if she dies? What is going to happen with me? And so on. So check on on her you know and she like this is a accomplished doctor she's an anesthetist and an accomplished person and she just started crying and, and started talking to her and giving her hope and and things like that because she knows my story she knows my wife's story and and you know and and so on and then she always she always um uh asked me questions and things like that 
and you know, like it's a normal day at the hospital. You, you're working with people and things like that. But everybody carries you know, not just the sick people that come, but even the workers there. You know, this is an this 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 girl, this anesthetist. You know, and she starts crying. You know, and it's like, oh, you know, and my dad is sad. You know, and you know, and she's just realizing that they're going to die. So you know, I mean, he's 89, and mother is 85. You know, and and she and they live overseas, and you know, and so, so they might die soon. You know, and so I'm talking to her as I'm having a peppermint tea, as we've got people coming into into the operating room and things like that, and, and talking to her and encouraging her, and and you know, and and she wipes off the tears and she, and she smiles. And, Thank you. It's always so refreshing, so refreshing. You know, thank you so much. You know, she goes back into the into the brain room. You know, and she continues doing her work. You know, and that's 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 glorious. That is glorious. And Sarah, you mentioned hospital. I don't know if you work in hospital or or a bit. You know, you, that's exactly what you see: broken humanity. Even like yesterday, we we had one patient. You know, as they walk in, they're working in anesthetics and. And so you always ask the question, so where are you coming from? What do you do? I say, I work in, in, in home home services. So oh, home services, oh, what, what do you mean? I say, well, young, young people that um can't live with their families and they can't live in foster homes. So they are, um, they, they're living in homes, you know, four, home, four, four bedrooms, you know, for, for, for young people. I say, okay, so we're talking, you're talking about how young people, how, how young are we talking about here? So, oh, you know, like, look, we really, the ideal is, you know, we're hoping for 16 and over, but that's not the reality. So, oh, well, what's the reality? Well, you know, we might have a 16, a 17 in the house, but we might have a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old in the house. That's broken humanity. That broken humanity. That 10 years old is going to learn how to smoke, mar smoke, smoke marijuana by the 16 years old in the same house because there's no parents, there's nothing. They just live in a, in a government house, the four of them. And that, that, was, that was one of our patients yesterday. That's where she works. Uh, breaks the heart. I mean, don't talk to me about free will. You know, that boy has no free will. That guy is just as the dream of my wife. That, that little boy of 10... He's in the middle of the ocean. He's just trying to grab hold of anything just to keep himself above water. That's, uh, you know, and if we do have good news, good, we, I believe that we do have good news. I believe that Jesus came to give us good news. And we do have good news to humanity. You know, and you don't need to preach to anybody. You just need to be nice to someone. Put your hands on the shoulders and say, I love you. And, you know, I love you. I sincerely love you. I, you know, and everything is going to be okay. You know, you don't need much. You don't need to preach or give a Bible study to anybody. You know, in fact, the nominational names are so corrupt that when somebody says today that I'm a Catholic, people are thinking abusing of children by priest. That's how corrupt now the name is. You look, you, somebody says Jehovah Witness, the person is thinking something else. Is thinking, but not just that, not just the number or Mormons, you know, or or Latter Day Saints, Saints, you know, they call them the Mormons or, or Adventists or Baptists or this or that. You just say that, and it's been so corrupted, even within the name, that you already portraying a, an image that is far from Christ. But even the name Christianity is being kidnapped by history and history and history of horror. That even saying that I'm not non-denominational Christian, even just using the word Christian is bad already. So, you know, I'm just happy to be a Samaritan. If I can be a good one, the better. I'm just happy, not even a Christian. I'm just a good Samaritan. I'll be fine just with that. If I come across to my neighbor as a good Samaritan, I think I'm living by the principles of Christ. I don't even need to use the name Christianity. It has been so corrupted and, and misused that now you cannot even use it as a business card to present yourself because it's, it's, it's filled with violence, with wars and things like that. These days we have a country using the same scriptures to create the biggest genocide in the 
2023 and 2024 and it's happening today I don't want to say the name because if i put this on youtube the name rises a flag and they'll cancel my video but you, we know where it is you know who it is and they quote in the scripture as a right to create currently a genocide in an area in the map you quote him quoting the command from God to Saul to destroy the Malachites. So, uh, it's crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. Anyway, um, we stop the recording here, uh, if you will, um, Sarah.